Welcome back to the BK Petcast, the podcast designed to help your dogs and cats live as long as possible. Today, we're joined by Dr. Judy Morgan. Dr. Morgan is a highly respected and internationally renowned veterinarian who specializes in blending traditional Western medicine with Eastern medicine techniques for optimal pet health. She owns two award-winning veterinary practices in New Jersey and employs the use of acupuncture, food therapy, chiropractic care, and herbal remedies to offer an integrative approach to pet care. As an author of multiple acclaimed books on pet wellness, Dr. Morgan Morgan provides her readers with invaluable insights into natural remedies and preventative health strategies. She's a thought leader in the field of integrative veterinary medicine. She's known for her innovative practices, commitment to education, and unwavering passion for animal wellness. Please welcome to the podcast, Dr. Judy Morgan. So I think the first big question I kind of want to ask you is what are heartworms? What, like basically what's the deal with them? What are they? How do they affect our, our pets? What's the whole story here? Uh, so um, when I was in veterinary school back in the age of dinosaurs uh, <laughs> and in all the vet practices that I would walk into probably for the first 10 or 15 years that I was in practice – Everybody had on their front counter a glass clear jar filled with formaldehyde with a dog heart filled with heartworms. Like it, it was just sort of like if you're going to be in veterinary practice, you're going to have one of these sitting on your front desk because oh nothing gosh. works better than than fear factor, right? So people go in and go, oh, my gosh, I had no idea that's what it was. So heartworms are long, skinny worms. They look kind of like a roundworm. They're they're white. Uh, they're about 12 inches long, and they actually live inside your dog's heart. Cats can get them, but they are not the normal end host. So if they get them, they'll get one or two worms. But if you think of a 12-inch worm inside a little kitty cat heart, one worm can you know, yeah, they have, have small hearts. I'm sure yeah, could clearly be a problem. So. Um, but you know, usually the people would have these jars that would have hundreds of worms inside these hearts. So, you know, it's pretty dramatic mm. effect. Uh, so that's what a heartworm is. It is a long worm, usually in multitudes that live actually inside the dog's heart. So as you can imagine, having a bunch of spaghetti inside the heart kind of clogs up the works. Um, and they are spread by mosquitoes. So the only way your dog could get heartworms is for there to be a heartworm positive dog, one that already has heartworms, that and they're adult worms that are making babies, and the babies are swimming around in the bloodstream, and the mosquito goes and bites that dog, sucks up the blood meal, the mosquito flies around for a couple of weeks with those babies in its salivary glands, and then that mosquito finds your dog and has a blood meal and injects those babies, which are now first stage larvae. Um, and so after your dog is bitten, so the, the, it's the, the little guys are deposited basically subcutaneously, they go through migration and maturing phases. And eventually after all the different stages that those larvae go through, they end up migrating into the heart and become the, the adult worms. So it's a multi-step process and it takes anywhere from six to nine months from the time your dog is bitten by a mosquito to the time you will actually be able to test your dog and get a positive test. So if you don't have your dog on heartworm preventative this summer, taking him in in September to see if he has heartworms, you're not going to know yet. You would have to wait till next spring. So when I graduated from school for heartworm preventative, we had daily heartworm preventative medication. Daily. It was di di yeah, diethyl carbamazine. See, I'm dating myself because you guys are like, what? <laughs> you didn't even know that existed. <laughs> uh, so it had to be given daily. And if you missed two days, forget it. Heartworms were a real possibility. And not people were not as um, not as good about annual exams and annual heartworm tests. And so we had a lot of heartworm positive dogs. Um, I, as much as I'm against chemicals and, and over vaccination and all that kind of stuff, there are things that we have definitely made improvements, you know, better living through some chemicals, nutrition, you know, a lot of stuff that we've learned over the years. 
Um, so we used to see a lot of heartworm positive dogs because people don't remember to give something every single day. You had to do it year round. Um, and what that pill is doing is it's not killing adult worms. It's killing those migrating larvae. Oh. So about the time I started practice, uh, so in the mid eighties, um, we, uh, ivermectin was the first monthly heartworm preventative that was developed. And so this was like, oh my gosh, we don't have to remember to do something every single day. We can do something once a month. And if we could go back, the uh, FDA only keeps the, the approval studies on the website for 20 years, but if we could, so they're gone now, but if we could go back and look at the original approval studies, we would see that that monthly heartworm preventative actually lasts closer to eight weeks. Wow. Definitely pretty darn good for six weeks, like, you know, 99% effective. And then it, you know, it gets a little bit lower, but even at eight weeks, we were still in the, you know, low 90% effectiveness because it's killing migrating larval stages. Um, but they said, well, and this is before, again, I'm going to shock you because this is before <laughs> the days of cell phones and those mini computers that we carry around everywhere with us that tell us what we have to do every day on our calendar. <laughs> so, you know, way back in the dark ages, we had calendars that we hung on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, there were stickers that came in the package, and maybe the stickers still come in the package because maybe there's a few of us dinosaurs who still use calendars. Um, but you would put the little heart sticker on your calendar to remind you to do this. And they came up with once a month instead of every six to seven weeks for a couple of reasons. One, if you forgot to give it, and you gave it a week late if you kind of went, oh, my gosh, you finally looked at oh. your calendar. And you gave it a week late, you were still pretty well protected. Little buffer period. <laughs> Little buffer. The other thing is we used to tell people, well, you make your mortgage payment once a month. You make your car payment once a month. Put the sticker on that. Or if you know that you're doing that on the fifth of every month, then your heartworm pill will also be. like the, Marry the two things together. So we were trying to make life easy for people. <laughs> and, you know, we are all a little bit forgetful and sometimes a lot lazy mm. and we want convenience. So it was a good thing. Um, so that's kind of how that whole, I, I don't even know if, what the original question was. Oh yeah. No, it's just like, what are hard words basically? Really no, I love it. So with with the way you described how heartworms are transmitted, you know, you have to have a dog with adult heartworms and then a mosquito bites them and then the mosquito holds on to that and then goes and bites your dog. That sounds like a lot to happen for your dog to actually get heartworms. So how prevalent are heartworms? Because it sounds like a complicated process. It is a bit of a complicated process. So part of how hard it is for your dog to get heartworms is – where do you live and how many heartworm positive dogs live near you? Like, does your dog have a high rate of exposure? I mean, if you're in Canada, you got like a zero. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you are in upper Minnesota, um, Maine, upstate New York, uh, the, the number of positive dogs that are the reservoir for that mosquito to get the, the immature worms from – it's very small. So that puts your risk level very low. Let's look at South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Southern Texas. The pool of dogs that are heartworm positive is huge. Interesting. Because a lot more dogs live outside. Mm -hmm. A lot more dogs get minimal veterinary care. Um, a lot more dogs are eating poor quality food. Like there's just a lot of things that go into it and we can talk more about how those things affect whether a dog is going to be more susceptible. But, and then we also look at what's the environment like. So in Louisiana, it's hot and humid and the mosquito yeah. population is like over the top crazy nuts. Um, I mean, in New Jersey, we used to say the mosquito was a state bird, but we don't have mosquitoes, anything up there like you would in, you know, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. So um, you have to look at that. What's your 
what's your overall mosquito population? What's the weather doing? What's the humidity level? What's the population of positive dogs that are that reservoir? So there's so many decisions that go into, will I put my dog on heartworm preventative? Does he need it? What's his risk factor? Um, so when we look at our northern tier states, we kind of say, well, you know, the risk factor there is a lot lower. Now, with that said, Dr. Lori Koger just made a comment on uh, one of my social media things the other day that she just, she works in Albany, New York. So it's kind of cold. Uh, she just diagnosed heartworm in two dogs. Wow. This week. And that's very unusual. Like in New Jersey, in my practice, if we, between the two practices, if we diagnose five a year, that was a lot. Wow. And if you consider we were treating 12,000 dogs a year, having five heartworm positives, that's a really low number. Yeah. And uh, what we find in the northern states very commonly is the positives are rescue dogs that have come up from the south oh. that were positive when they left or they hadn't tested positive yet, but they had already been exposed. And so we had a couple of those in our practice where people rescued the dogs when they rescued them, they were tested negative. And then the next year when we tested them, it was like, oopsie. Right, yep. now they were matured. He was carrying those. Uh, yeah, and so now it shows up. Um, you can get false negatives on tests if they only have male uh, heartworms, which oh. is not that common, or if they only have a couple of worms. So if you have a dog who only has a couple of worms living in their heart, it, there may not be enough um, worm antigen there for the test to pick up. Um, so we can get false po false negatives. Um, false positives are pretty rare. Uh, and there's a bunch of different kinds of tests that can be done. And like in our practice, if we got a positive, we never relied on one test. We would always do a follow-up mm -hmm. test of a different kind so that we had, you know, before I would tell somebody that had to treat the dog for heartworms, I wanted to be darn sure that, yes, this is what we're dealing with. Yeah, totally. Um, so I'm in North Carolina right now. Uh, we had a stray dog show up at our house, a, a, this beautiful coon hound, and my husband really wants a coon hound, and I keep saying, why do you want a coon hound? But, you know. <laughs> He's like, I want to name him Duke. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you can name him Duke and we'll keep him. Uh, but this dog came with 5,000 fleas, 5,000 ticks, and apparently 5,000 heartworms and intestinal parasites oh. as well. He Like this guy, if you if you Duke. named it, he had it. Oh, my God, he was a mess. Um, and so uh, Hugh and I went away for the weekend. Like the dog came in our yard and was looking really hungry, so we fed him. And then we're like, okay, well, here, you know, we gave him a blanket. And, you know, I couldn't bring him in the house because he was loaded with everything. Thing. And, you know, I get a lot of dogs. So, um, and then my mom and I decided we would give them, a, you know, an essential oil flea and tick bath and pull fleas and ticks off of them. We did the best we could. He, you know, I don't even know this dog. I'm like, am I going to get eaten while I'm trying to get Yeah, no kidding. I don't even know. You know, and I've got my 85 year old mother helping me. So I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah, this might not work out well. So we did the best we could. So uh, we were away Monday morning. Gwen loads the dog into her truck, takes the dog to our veterinarian, leaves him for the day and says, do a workup on the dog, figure out what's going on with him. So we get the phone call. Well, he's still got fleas. He's still got ticks. I'm like, yeah, duh, because his bath was pretty marginal. Um, still got fleas, still got ticks. And she's like, we can give him some, you know, isoxazoline. And I'm like, please do not yeah, do that. Yeah, chill with, with that. <laughs> um, and she said, by the way, he has heartworms and he's got intestinal parasites. We're like, yeah, shocking. Probably, you know, probably has a few tick-borne diseases on there as well. Mm. So uh, Gwen goes and picks up the dog at the end of the day. We have a 500-hour bill for all that. You know, we had her since he was heartworm positive. I'm like, go ahead and do the x-rays. You know, if we're going to treat him, I, I need to know. Do the chem screen. Do the urinalysis. Do it. Like, let, we're going. Mm -hmm. Gwen brings the dog home, puts him on her back porch while she goes inside to you know, put something away for one minute, comes back out just in time to see the dog jump over the porch railing, run off through the woods, never to be seen again. <laughs> and still to this day, he's never come back. Oh, my God. He just came in for a, a quick cleanup, and he was out of there. He got a cleanup. He got, you know, four or five good meals and said, wow, this is pretty good. But, yeah, yeah no, you took me to the vet. I am out. Wow. Oh, that is hilarious. <laughs> well, at least he got a so little yeah, boost, a little fuel in the tank. Yeah, that was our $500, you know, donation. Yeah, to gift to the that. gods or whatever. <laughs> That is hilarious. Anyway, so, so yes, heartworms are prevalent down here. Uh, I don't keep my dogs on heartworm preventative, so I was like, yeah, this is a bit of a problem. This dog was just in our yard, but it was okay. <laughs> I have a question about heartworms in relation to other wild animals in the areas and humans. So what does that look like? Do heart Are heartworms common in like wild animals? So like if there was a deer, can that transfer heartworms as well? 
No, but other canid species oh. can get them. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if they do autopsies on coyotes, wolves, foxes, sometimes they'll find them. Um, but it's not, like, highly prevalent. And if they do find them, they usually only find a few worms. Like, um, and, and we have to look at what their lifestyle looks like compared to some of the things we do to our animals. Mm. And so sometimes their immune systems are a lot better. <laughs> um, and then as far as people... There have been reported cases, uh, very rare, and usually they're in like places like around the equator. Oh. So if we look at some of the really poor islands where, again, we would have a huge high heartworm population mm. in the dog population, um, but it, it, cats and humans and non-canid species are dead end hosts. So like if I developed heartworms in my heart, I'm not going to be uh, – mosquitoes are not going to be able to bite me and transmit it to something oh, else. Got it. So a dead-end host is it's like kind of stops here. Um, so those are, are very, very rare. Um, you, yeah, I mean, if you look through literature, you can find weirdnesses of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But like herbivores are not ever going to get them. So rabbits and um, – horses and cows it's just not something that exists in yeah interesting yeah that is really interesting so you know you talked about some of these kind of isolated groupings of cases up in the north and like upstairs i think you said albany or something when yeah. when these do happen do they tend to like happen and spread a little bit or do, is there not much spread because what i'm envisioning is like a dog comes up to the north from the south it gets bit by you know three or four mosquitoes they transfer it to a couple dogs Oh, but then it does take a long time to develop before it can be transferred again. Okay, I right. think I answered my own question. Yeah, so no, we really, we really don't. Um, and you know, I've had households where one dog in the household is positive and everybody else is negative. Interesting. And, you know, and they don't transmit it. So, um, it, because it's such an involved process, and I mean, it's really interesting. Mosquitoes are attracted and repelled by certain. Um, I want to call it smells and tastes, but I don't, it, I don't think it's, it's what their receptors are picking right. up or not exactly what we would do. Um, and so, like, if you, have you ever been at an outdoor party and you've got a couple of people who are like, oh, my God, I'm being eaten alive by mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And other people are like, really? I haven't had a bite. I'm fine. Yep. So, you know, we all smell different. And we, our blood all tastes different. And some people, like you can have a flea infestation in a house and you'll have that one cat who is loaded or that one dog is loaded. And the rest of them are like, meh, I got a couple. <laughs> and you'll have a couple people in the house who are being literally eaten alive and have a million flea bites and others who are like, oh, we have fleas. So interesting. So it is. And so there are things that we can do to make our, our animals taste better. Yeah. Yep. Totally. And we, we've talked about those in depth and we'll continue to talk about those. So you talked a little bit about uh, the treatment and you said yourself, you know, you live in probably a higher heartworm area than I would say we do here in Colorado, but you don't use oh, yeah. heartworm prevention. So I'm assuming, you know, from learning from you and other people, you, you take this period of maturity that they have to get to before they start doing damage. And then you test and treat if they do have it. Now, if you let those eggs in and let them get to the heart before you start treating, does that already create damage? Or can you catch it and treat it early enough before it starts to do damage? So the damage is really dependent on the heartworm load. So again, if you have an animal with a couple of worms living in their heart, probably not going to see much. Because there is actually no treatment for heartworms in cats. So if you have oh. a cat who gets those one or two worms, you, you cannot use the treatments that we use on the dogs. So they literally have to live with them. The interesting thing is <clears throat> if you have an animal with adult heartworms and you do nothing, uh, but you prevent them from having a future exposure and development of new adult heartworms – those adult worms will die within about two years. Oh, interesting. So if you do nothing, they're going to die off, <clears throat> which is partly why uh, a lot of people will do the slow kill versus the quick kill method for treatment if you have a positive heartworm case uh, because we can support the animals and have a much slower die off and a lot less adverse reactions to that die off. Gotcha. So um, 
what are the typical heartworm medications that conventional vets use or the ones that maybe a lot of people are hearing that their pets should be on on a monthly basis? So we have heartworm prevention and we have heartworm treatment. So prevention is preventing adult worms from developing in the heart. So, and the prevention does, you know, your dog is still going to get bitten by the mosquito that's carrying the larvae. The prevention is actually a parasiticide. So it means it's killing parasites. It doesn't prevent anything other than the development of the adult worms because it's killing certain larval stages. So it kills like stage three, stage four larvae. So that might be something your dog was exposed to a couple of months mm -hmm. ago, or a month ago. Um, so what it's doing is it's killing those migrating larvae so that they can't grow up to be adults. Uh, and that's how it works. So we have monthly, um, there's quite a few different products on the market. So the original was the ivermectin, which was heart guard. And then milbamycin came about, which was interceptor. And then revolution, which is a topical, came around. Um, and now they're basically combining, which is selamectin. Uh, they're now combining those with other things so that they can get better things on their label. Mm. Like, oh, well, we added in a second drug, so now it kills tapeworms too. Well, I don't know too many animals that need monthly tapeworm deworming, but whatever. <laughs> or they add in uh, something for intestinal parasites, like roundworms and hookworms. Uh, now they're combining them with flea and tick preventatives. It is amazing. Like the, Every day I get something new in my inbox. Look at this new, bigger, better parasite prevention. It'll kill everything. In, well, in including your pet, but you know, we'll just ignore that part. Um, not funny, and then but... there is what's even worse for heartworm prevention, which is the long acting injection called moxidectin or called ProHeart. The ingredient is moxidectin. So there's ProHeart 6, uh, which when it originally came on the market a dozen years ago, uh, it killed so many dogs that they actually took it off the market. The FDA did their job one of Surprising. the times. Uh, it, it, but it was so bad that, and there were so many complaints that it actually did get pulled off the market. Uh, and then a few years later, it mysteriously came back. And I said, well, what did we change? Uh, we didn't change anything. It's still got the same amount of moxidectin in there, which is a neurotoxin, causes seizures, causes liver failure, causes death. Um, they didn't change that. They changed one of the carriers, um, or one of the preservatives, something in the injection and said, well, now it's better. Eh, not really. Um, and then they also said that every veterinarian before giving that injection had to present the owner with a printed handout that said, these are the reactions that have been seen in the past. These are the things to watch for. This is the potential downside. Uh, and you're supposed to sign off that, yes, you still want that. Now, Again, people want convenience. Oh, I don't even have to remember to do that pill once a month because that's so annoying. Uh, or my dog doesn't like it. He won't take it. He spits it out. So, yeah, this injection is amazing. Uh, well, depends whether you want a dead yeah. dog. So after that's been on the market for a few years, then a couple years ago, they said, hey, we have a better idea because people really are lazy. Instead of coming in every six months. We're going to make this a once a year shot. The more is better how are we fallacy, make it a once huh? A year shot? Yeah, more yep. is better. So, how are we going to do that? We'll triple the dose of moxidectin. That math doesn't even add up. <laughs> I know. So, they tripled the dose, and now it lasts 12 months. And people are like, oh, and I see it on social media all the time. Oh, it's great. We just go once, once a year. We get that shot and all their vaccines, and it's great. You know, and then I, three days later, it's like, oh, my dog died. It was so weird. Golly. So, you know, for people who are listening, I will say there are there's bad and then there's worse and then there's just kill the dog now. Do not do long acting injections. There is no antidote if your dog has a reaction. You can't get it out once you put it in. So if they develop seizures, tremors, inability to walk, liver failure, kidney failure, there's not a darn thing you can do about it. It, your animal just died because your veterinarian wanted to give you something convenient that's kind of expensive. Uh, but, you know, forget convenience, forget money. Let's talk about the health of the animal. And no, we don't. If you live in Louisiana and you don't want your dog to get heartworms, you got to do some things to prevent that. And whether you're doing something natural or whether you're doing something chemical, if you're in an area where you absolutely need chem chemical prevention, uh, let's go for it, but let's use something safe. So we're going to go with one of the 
oral once a month products that is not combined with dewormers, flea and tick, and other parasiticides. Like, let's put the least number of toxins in that we yeah, can. Yeah, no kidding. So in, <clears throat> let's say we're talking maybe not the extreme ends of the earth. Like we're not talking the really, really cold spots and we're not talking the super wet and humid spots. For the average pet parent, what do you recommend as a heartworm treatment plan? Do they, or, or, or yeah, or preventative more so. Prevention. Yeah, like is it something where you just yeah. let them get heartworms and test later and then treat or what do you think? No. No, you don't want to just let them get heartworms. And for people, a lot of people, um, so it, in New Jersey, we're, we're kind of in that middle spot that you're talking about. You know, it's frozen tundra in the winter, and then it's 85, humid, ridiculous in the summers. Um, so there has been a lot of research that has originally, the research said that two-week period that the um, baby larvae is in the salivary glands of the mosquito because it takes two weeks it has to go remember it has to go through a couple larval stages in the oh i didn't glands. know it was a set amount of time uh, in the mosquito whoa yeah so it takes about two weeks so it's not like the mosquito bites this dog and then bites your dog tomorrow you need it's like, not like disease spread that's what i thought it was like right yeah no so you've got to have this period in between where this process is going on inside the mosquito well if the temperature drops too low like in the winters, and this is why we don't see much up north, uh, the temperature drops too low, that process stops. Oh. So you need two weeks of a certain temperature around the clock. Like it, like it can't be warm during the day and cold at night. If the temperature gets too cold at night, the process stops. So th we used to say 57 degrees. Like all the research said 57 degrees was that magic number. So um, for a lot of years in my practice, once I became more holistic, we would follow the weather. And so I would have everybody stop their heartworm preventative for the winter because I'm like, let's give our dogs a chance to detox. Let's give them a chance not to have neurotoxins put in their body for six months out of the year if that's what it looks like. And then I would watch for when does the temperature – like where's my two-week window where the temperature didn't go below 57 degrees at night for two whole weeks? And usually it wasn't until about the 4th of July. I was going to say, it can't be even close to the beginning or end of summer. It's like right yeah. in the middle. So it was usually it was usually like the beginning of July. So what we would do is we would have all of our dogs, in all of our patients, come in sometime between the middle of May and middle of June and do their heartworm test. Because you don't want to put a dog on heartworm preventative who has heartworms. Because if they have immature heartworms swimming around in their bloodstream they can have a serious allergic reaction called an anaphylactic oh. reaction and drop dead. So you always have to have a negative test before you start your dog on the monthly preventative tablets. So interceptor, heart guard. Um, so you always want to have that negative test. And then once you have that negative test, you have 30 to 45 days because remember, when you give the pill, it's killing everything that they were exposed to for the past four to six weeks. So if we got our test by, you know, May 15th to June 15th, and then we were starting the begin first week in July, great. Anything they've been exposed to this spring, we're, we're already on top of it. And then we would look at when do we get a couple of hard freezes. And so that was usually November. So most of my patients took their heartworm pills like July 1st to November 1st. And because of that six to eight week window, most of my clients would give their tablets every six weeks because we have these little pocket <laughs> computers that can tell us to do that. Uh, and so they were giving like four pills over the course of the season, which is a lot less than the 12 pills that we're told to give. Now, is there potentially a little bit of risk? I mean, let's look, we just got two positive cases in Albany and I don't know anything about those cases. I don't know if those were dogs who were brought up from the South. I, you know, I don't know what their exposure was, how they got it didn't ask. Um, so, you know, if you're doing one of these amended protocols, you also have to have the mindset of, I'm trying to reduce toxins. Is there a chance, you know, what is the, you have to look at what's your risk aversion. So you look at, this is like when the insurance salesman comes and says, you need a life insurance policy for $500,000, or you need, you know, pet insurance, you need homeowner's insurance, you need, you know, automobile insurance. What is your risk tolerance level? 
So I know what my risk tolerance level is regarding this issue, and it's going to be different for every single dog. Uh, my daughter lives next door to me. So our dogs, you know, you would say we both live in North Carolina. They have the same risk factors, but they don't. Her dogs are big dogs who spend about 10 hours a day oh, wow. outside. I have little tiny dogs who spend 23 and a half hours inside. <laughs> <laughs> and so they'll go out and run around the backyard during their little play times and potty times, but they're not hanging out outside. Mm. And we don't hang out outside if the mosquitoes come out. And if we are hanging out outside on a nice evening and I see one mosquito, I'm getting my essential oil sprays, and either I send the dogs inside or they get sprayed, we get sprayed, we turn the fans on on our patio, and the mosquitoes oh, go away. Nice. So what we do is prevent exposure to the mm. mosquito. So even though my dogs live next door to Gwen's dogs, totally, totally different exposure levels. Um, so that's why there is no one size fits all. You have to evaluate where do I live? So even if I lived, there are a lot of people in Texas and Louisiana who don't give heartworm preventative because their dogs are more like my dogs, you know, like, yeah, his exposure is pretty minimal. And Hey, you know what? I live in a neighborhood, this really huge neighborhood and like 99% of the people in this neighborhood have their dogs on heartworm preventative. The chance of having a heartworm positive dog in this neighborhood Pretty oh. slim. Now, where I live, the chances of having a heartworm positive dog are pretty good because one showed up in my yard. That's so. interesting, <laughs> though. Like, the more people around you that do heartworm preventative, the less chance your dog could contract heartworms. That's an interesting, like, paradox, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, like, talk to all your neighbors. Hey, you giving heartworm preventative? You giving heartworm like, preventative? Sweet. That's great. Your I'm veterinarian's good. doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> So really, it is, it's an individual exposure. Um, and then, you know, there's so many factor, so many other factors that play into whether your dog is a parasite magnet. Got or it. Not. So I think that's a great segue into our next, our next question. Uh, here at the BK Pets, we're obviously big on diet and nutrition, as are you. How can a pet's diet and what they consume affect their susceptibility to heartworms? So diet, vaccinations, chemicals... Um, you know, and that includes like chemicals that you use in your house for cleaning, chemicals that you spray on your yard, everything that our dogs are exposed to that chips away at their immune system makes them less resistant to parasites. So I used to have this thing in my practice. If I would pick up a dog with heartworms, I could just about guarantee it was also going to have roundworms, whipworms, oh. and hookworms. Because their immune system's trashed. That's why they got this parasite. And by the way, they're going to have 10 other parasites. Um, it's very common. Uh, so, for instance, my dogs never have intestinal parasites. We don't have flea problems. We don't have tick problems. We don't have heartworm problems. They eat a raw diet. They eat a very healthy raw diet. They are not eating highly processed food with synthetic vitamins and minerals added in, sprayed with rancid fats. That is taxes the immune system that's the body saying oh my gosh i'm being attacked from all directions i like my immune system is so busy fighting off all that synthetic crap being put in uh you know chemicals in the environment that they're exposed to like their body is so busy worrying about that it's like parasites i low on the list i, I can't even um so you know when you're over vaccinating your animals and the immune system is in overdrive Again, the immune system's like, look, I got too many fish to fry here. You just like, there's so many things coming at me. It's like, you know, the bombs are coming from all directions. I don't even know where to start. Um, so absolutely. And then, you know, we can add things to the diet, like dun, dun, garlic. Dun. I know, garlic. <laughs> garlic is toxic to dogs. It's not. Um, so when we add things that are repellent to mosquitoes, coconut oil, there's, a, there's another yeah. controversial one. Coconut oil, garlic, um, there's a lot of different herbs that we can add, keeping their, their liver in top shape. So things like dandelion root or dandelion green, keeping their circulation in good shape with things like hawthorn, uh, immune boosters like mushrooms, like there's so many things, colostrum, so many things that we can do to keep their immune system healthy and non-reactive, uh, except for when it needs to react. So let's Let's look at the mosquito comes along, it injects a foreign body. It injects 
this baby larva into the dog. And the immune system says, oh crap, invader, I better go kill that. And a good immune system will do that. And there's actually, I have to find the link. There is a great video on mm. YouTube, a time-lapse photography of the blood cells attacking a larva that's Ooh. injected. Whoa. And it is so amazing. So literally you have this, it looks like a little string, the little larvae that's in the bloodstream. And then you see the white blood cells just literally coming out of everywhere and they surround it and wrap it up like a cocoon and literally destroy wow. it. It is the coolest thing. So when we have a healthy immune system that has the ability and, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, foreign invader, I'm going to go attack. They'll attack. And they'll take care of it. So we can have animals who live in high heartworm areas who have very healthy immune systems and don't get heartworms even though they are exposed. So it's just like, you know, it's like any other disease. How many of us, like I, I have a granddaughter who goes to preschool and let me tell you, that kid brings everything I'm sure. home. Does every person in the house get sick? No. Nope. Who gets sick? The person whose immune system is at its weakest at the moment. So there's been a couple of things she's brought home where all of us have gotten it. <laughs> and there's been a lot of things she's brought home where none of us have gotten it or one of us will get a really mild case of something. So, you know, disease and parasites, bacteria, are everywhere around us. We are exposed to bacteria. I'm sitting here right now. There's bacteria falling out of the sky. I mean, they're everywhere. Why am I not falling apart with overwhelming infection, even though I'm literally bathed in bacteria? Because my immune system says, those are the good guys. We'll let them in. Oh, those are the bad guys. We'll spit them out. Um, so having a healthy immune system, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Will Falconer, but he has an ebook called Vital Animals Don't Get Heartworms, um, because his his uh, platform is Vital Animals or the Vital Animal or something like that. Um, but it's it's great, and it really talks about what I'm talking about. That when you have a healthy immune system, you don't get overwhelmed with parasite infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections, you know, we just, we don't see that. So the, the real, the real basis of health is keeping that immune system healthy, which means good diet, minimize vaccines, minimize chemicals, um, you know, lots of exercise, like all the, 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 the pillars of keeping our pets as healthy yep. as we And can. we teach, you know, our audience listening to this, I'm sure has heard us say a million times that a healthy diet can potentially add years onto a dog's life. And it seems like it just doesn't stop there. A healthy diet can literally prevent heartworms. So, I mean, yeah. I, I guess we just can't even stress that enough. So, uh, Dr. Morgan, no. I think that's all the questions we have for heartworms. Thank you so much. Like, every time we get on here with you, not only do I learn so much, but I'm just fired up. I cannot wait for this episode to come out and everybody hear this. And you always provide so much value. So thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you. And just a word of caution to any pet parent who's listening, talk to your veterinarian. And just remember, if you have a traditional veterinarian, they may have a different outlook on it. But really evaluate your pet's health, your pet's exposure level. You know, are you somebody who is camping out in the woods all the time, traipsing through the swamps? Or do you have couch potatoes like I do that I've spent so little time outside um, and have healthy immune system. So really look at your pet as an individual. Don't just say, oh, well, she said don't give heartworm preventative. That's not what I said. What I said, evaluate your pets. And um, and that's why my daughter and I have different protocols, even though we Very, very them. interesting. Dr. Morgan, thank you again so much. For those listening or watching, thank you so much for making us a part of your day. As always, I'm Bryce. I'm Kinsey. And we'll see you in the next episode. Yeah.